Oh, hey, we are live. Hi, everybody, and welcome to History Happy Hour. You'll notice that somebody is missing. I'll give you a few moments to suss out who that is. Okay, you probably figured it out. Uh, Chris Anderson couldn't be here for the intro, but fear not. He is part of the program because this is an encore episode about singer and civil rights activist Marian Anderson. A reminder that History Happy Hour is brought to you with the help of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours. And we always want to give a shout out to our Patreon supporters, especially our top shelf supporters. Please help keep the History Taps open here by becoming a patron on Patreon. And uh, we appreciate your help in doing that. You can do so by going to www.patreon.com slash history happy hour. And please, if you are watching us on Facebook, please follow us. If you're watching on the HHH YouTube play page, please subscribe to get news of future broadcasts. And now, are you ready, everybody? Let's go to the videotape. <laughs> And the bar is open. The bar is open. Um, and so, Chris, today, I think we have a really neat show. Uh, I'm very agree. excited about it. Uh, and uh, it's kind of the story of a moment uh, that helped to power a movement. And on Easter Sunday, 1939, uh, contralto Marian Anderson stepped up to a microphone in front of the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C., and there were 75,000 people out there. She had been she, she, she had been banned from performing at Constitution Hall, operated by the Daughters of American Revolution, banned because she was black. I mean, it was just straight out because of race. Uh, and so she performed in this massive open air uh, concert that was also carried live on national radio. And it was kind of a landmark moment in the civil rights movement. And it is the subject of an upcoming documentary, uh, American Experience documentary on PBS called Voice of Freedom, Turbulent Times Turned an Artist into a Hero. And it premieres on February 15th. And so today, uh, to kind of talk about the historical context of that story, uh, we have as our guest a historian who appears in that documentary and who has been listening to us bantering for the last two minutes, wondering Poor when woman. the heck we were going to get to her. So we should bring in Adrian Lentz Smith, who is a history professor at Duke University, where she's the associate chair of the history department. She's a scholar of African American history as well as 20th century history. She is the author of Freedom Struggles, African Americans in World War I, and she appeared in the American Experience documentary, The Great War. She's involved in a bunch of other things. I don't have time to do the whole introduction, but so we're so happy that she made time to be here with us. Adria, welcome to History Happy Hour. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Well, thanks for joining us. Excellent. And we've been chatting with her for a few minutes before the show, and we already are, you know, real excited to have her here. But did you bring a cocktail? That's what I wanted to know. I did. I brought a vodka tonic with awesome. a little bit of lime. lemon because we were out of lime. <laughs> we won't tell. And okay. <laughs> Christopher, I assume that you have... Well, in honor of the bard, oh, I have okay. my scotch. Tomorrow is Burns Night, so I yeah, have a little scotch. You, you learn all sorts of stuff here in History you Happy do? Hour. Um, so to start us off, we're going to play... Wait, wait, wait. Uh, what are you drinking? Oh, sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I have a, a, a an IPA, but it's in my Lining Kugel glass because uh, of we were in Wisconsin yesterday, and Lining Kugel being a Wisconsin beer, that's my relationship to the beer. <laughs> okay, we we're going to start off by playing uh, a, 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 the trailer, uh, a promo clip from this uh, ex uh, uh, documentary, Voice of Freedom, to kind of uh, set us in the story, uh, and, uh, and then we'll come back out and start talking about it. But let's start with this trailer. Marian Anderson challenged and broadened people's ideas of what the souls of black folk looked and sounded like. She has this reach and appeal that crosses age and color lines. The quality and the range of the voice, 
just knock people's socks off. What Marian Anderson did in the 1920s and 30s was really popularize African-American spirituals at a time when there's a strong denial of Black excellence. Her music was more high art. In Europe, she grew as an artist. Suddenly, she was a diva. Music was her refuge, but she was also a risk taker. She had to support herself and her family in a time when there was violence against African Americans. But she is willing to show up because she is not going to accept the terms of racial oppression. The Marian Anderson concert turns the Lincoln Monument into the touchstone for civil rights. She became the face of a movement. That was something she could never step back from. So, Adrian, um, let's talk about the America that this happened in. Um, if you, she kind of starts her career about 20 years before this concert, really right after World War I. It's a time of pretty intense racial conflict. Can you kind of give us a, a sense of that, of the context that this story begins in? Sure. Um, so, Marian Anderson grew up in Philadelphia. She's She's sort of an older generation of black folks in the North, but she's beginning her career one in a Philadelphia that's being reshaped as many um, Northern cities are by the great migration, this giant influx of African-Americans moving into cities and Northern and Midwestern cities, especially. And she's beginning it, as you mentioned, in this World War I era, which has all kinds of upheaval from, you know, a pandemic, from illness to the uh, sort of changing effects of the Great Migration to really the blowback effect in the aftermath of the war of folks who are committed to segregation um, and racial inequality kind of battening down the hashes to, pr to push back on African-Americans um, like sort of drives for, for broader citizenship rights, right? So if we think of the war as this moment of profound political and social change, when all sorts of things might happen, you have a black freedom struggle that's ramping up and you have a defenders of a, race, a white racial democracy that are ready to carry the battle for democracy back to American streets. So um, the summer of 1919, which folks at the time and historians have repeated uh, refer to as the red summer of 1919 was a summer of domestic battles over whether or not Jim Crow would continue to be the way of the land. So, so Adrian, could you just get into this a little bit more and describe um, what the red summer was? Because I know in the, in the documentary they talk about um, she's going to go to Chicago for this conference of um, African American musicians. Um, that should be a pretty normal thing to do, but she's right. doing it in the summer of 1919, and this is a big risk. What is that? What is what is that summer? That summer saw a wave of race riots, which we should say, like we have a tendency to think of race riots as being kind of like people breaking windows and buildings or property damage. When folks talk about race riots in the early part of the 20th century, they're really talking about things that look like pogroms in, in Europe, right? These are mobs, murderous mobs um, of often white folks trying to mow down black people and destroy kind of black centers of cultural and economic life. So those happened all over the U.S. in um, D.C. as one of the most famous ones, um, Chicago as perhaps the most famous one, but there were dozens large and small scale. Um, and there were lynchings, many lynchings of African Americans, including some soldiers in uniform. And the extent and the violence and, and the brutality of it all shook black Americans who'd really thought that serving in a war 
that was named as a war for democracy and serving well and valiantly might change something. And the violence of the Red Summer was a way of announcing that their service not only hadn't changed anything and it incited the defenders of segregation mm -hmm. even more than black failure might have. And she's there in Chicago as it's going on. And Marian Anderson, who seems to wander into these hot spots yes. of, of human <laughs> history, um, Marian Anderson is in Chicago for a concert and in the midst of, of this riot, right? And she's young still, and this is early in her career, and it would have been terrifying for anyone, um, but for someone who's only just leaving the bosom of what had been a very nurturing com com community, right. it must have been <laughs> yeah. tr incredibly traumatic. And, and we've talked a little bit about um, uh, about this about this uh, situation of the returning veterans, and you you really and this documentary deals with it a little bit. You do have sort of some soldier versus soldier uh, stuff going yeah. on here. You literally have, I think, I live uh, on South Michigan Avenue. Uh, Bronzeville is the neighborhood just south of me, which is. Uh, uh, is and was uh, primarily was an African American neighborhood. And I think the, you had veterans of the 300 370th is the one from Illinois, the uh, National I Guard. I never the, the I'm eighth kind of Illinois Chris because I think he knows. But it was uh, the eighth Illinois militia. So yeah, right, 370th and the 370th. And, 370th. and they, I, yeah. there's guys who are in the army who are setting up like machine mm -hmm. gun emplacements to try to defend their neighborhood. I mean, it is a brutal. Right brutal time. And and I, um, you mentioned Washington, and this is a few years later than 1919, but sort of in a, in a tenor of the time moment, there's a little clip in this documentary. And it doesn't even sort of say much, except it's talking about how Washington is so segregated. And it is a 1925 Klan march in Washington. And Adrian, I got to tell you, this footage blew me away. Because yeah. here we talk about, you know, issues of white supremacy or stuff now this is look at this i mean look at this march and and by the way they're not wearing masks on their faces they're not hiding who they are it is just so out there that it's like it's almost like taking oh sorry it's almost like taking ownership right by the yeah. by the clan and by and by certain elements of of uh, white american society yeah, I mean, we have this tendency to talk about the Klan as if the kind of night riding vigilante stuff defines it. And that's true in a certain moment of um, of being in the Klan. And even then, I mean, the sort of like 1960s anti-civil rights sort of version of the Klan, there was a little more of that. But even then, it was still pretty overt. But the, the Klan that came into being, what we call the second Klan, after 1915, inspired by Birth of a Nation, was not, uh, um, it wasn't like, what's that? It's not like the Watchmen, right? Where the members are, are secret and masked. These were, you know, everyday folks. These were the, like civic leaders. These were ministers. These were all sorts of folks and they knew um, each other and they weren't embarrassed and they had profound political power in many states. And it was almost like, you know, a, a a social or civic organization to some extent um, that was deeply anti-immigrant, anti-black, and um, determined to protect what they saw at the time as traditional um, family values. Well, and anti-Catholic and pretty much anti-everybody anti, but them. <laughs> and, and, yeah, anti-every, yeah, the, the anti-Catholic, and for them the anti-Catholic and the anti-immigrant because yep. of who the immigrants sure, right. often sure. were and anti-Semitic and all but Which is ironic considering what did they say something like 60% of doughboys in World War One, English was not their first language or they came yeah. from a, but, but anyway, so yeah. it, it's a very troubled time in America um, and we'll get a little bit more into this as we go along, but could you tell us a little bit about um, Marian Anderson and her kind of the arc of her career? Because I think we've lost sight of what a sensation she was I mean, she starts kind of in the church choir in Philadelphia, but she gets pretty famous. She's not a second stringer she, by any means. And she becomes, I mean, so you're right. She begins in Philadelphia. She starts in her church. She's rejected from the, you know, the Philadelphia Musical Academy where she um, 
wanted to train again because of race, but she's taken under the wing of another very like, internationally successful and famous black singer, Roland Hayes, who helps her launch a career, um, eventually goes to Europe singing um, kind of what I described, I think in the documentary is high art, sort of classical right. music in this amazing contralto. And she gains an international following, right? She's one of the most famous singers in the world and an incredibly successful um, singer. So she sort of begins her life, well, she begins her life in middle-class status, falls into poverty when her father dies, mm -hmm. but like builds kind of wealth and celebrity through the power of this truly remarkable voice. Yeah. Well, and I, okay, go ahead. No, no, please. No, I, one of the things that strikes me too is that um, once she goes to Europe, she's she's famous for, as you describe it, it's high art. It's not, let's have the African-American person sing some spirituals. I mean, well, she, that's right. part of her repertoire, but she's an artist. And, and yeah. that's, at least once she goes to Europe, that's what she's known for. Yeah, um, and she's not, I mean, who is awesome? She's not Josephine Baker, who I think is really, really cool, but who is able to trade on a kind of French fascination and right. exoticization of her and her sexuality yeah. as a black woman, right? She's not, she's not that, right? Like right. Marian Anderson is basically like, um, like, I don't even know how to, she's, She's the she's voice for, of the century, right? Yeah, she's the voice and, and she's foregrounding that voice and she's never like she's not retreating from from being a black woman, but she's not letting people craft that into their right. stereotypes or expectations of what that what yeah. that might mean or be. Yeah. Well, I, I was struck um, uh, uh, jumping ahead in two ways, but I'll, I'll come back. But I was struck by I mean, I, voice of the century was a was a was a promo label uh, attached to her, but it came from a remark by Toscanini, the great uh, uh, classical music, uh, I, I'm sorry to say conductor, composer, not even sure, uh, but, um, but uh, it, he said, you know, a voice like this comes around only once in a hundred years. Uh, and, but it did always seem to me uh, that uh, regarding um, you know, civil rights or, or issues, social issues generally, that she was a bit of a reluctant hero, that she, she, yeah. she, she did, she let herself, you know, you know, take on that role, but that it wasn't, you know, this was not like her driving fiery thing. It was her, her fire was, was her art. And she goes to Europe. I, I thought it was interesting. She goes to Europe in 1927, and I think she's there for about seven years. Um, and on the one hand, she's finding that, you know, she's not facing the same racism uh, as she is at home. But at the same time, there's a weird little thing going on in Nazi Germany that has its own racist uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, attitude that's coming up at the same time. So it's kind of a real, I think you call it a time of great ferment in Europe. Yeah. Yeah, and one, we should say she also goes to Europe after having had a failure of a concert in the United States right. where the critics are like, I mean, she's good, but she could use a bit more seasoning, right? right. So she right. emerges as the, the voice of, this, of the century. But like, you know, she's a protege, but very few geniuses come out like perfectly Fully done. Fully formed, yeah. You know? Fully formed. Um, but you're right, she goes to Europe in 1927. Um, there's the emergence and and um, solidification of Nazi power in these same years. I think it should give us pause and make us remember contingency and context to think about the fact that Anderson, as with many African Americans, could still be talking about finding more space to be themselves um, in a in lands where fascism was taking hold than they could in the US, right? Okay. Um, but I think it's also important for us to keep in mind the ways in which these kind of vernacular expressions of white supremacy or these kind of systems of racialized power are in conversation with one another in this period too. 
Um, so if the Klan is incredibly powerful in the 1920s, if Jim Crow in the U.S. South is feeling as strong and as secure as it would ever feel in, in this moment, it's important to keep in mind that the Nazis who are pulling together their system of racial, of racial exclusion and ordering and all of these things are pointing to and learning from um, American racial systems as they're, as they're putting it together and responding to criticism occasionally with a kind of like, I don't know what you guys are giving us such a hard time for. We learned this from your American South. And African-American critics are quick to say that too, right? So you've got Anderson abroad and other expats abroad um, finding a place for themselves, but you'd also have some observers uh, domestically and abroad looking to Germany and seeing things that they recognize from the American experience. Now, and, and Adrian, are, is Marion or any of the other black performers that are in Europe, are they writing back about, even bef bef before Hitler comes to power, but just Europe in general, are they writing back and saying, you're not going to believe this. I got to stay at the Savoy or I got to go into a restaurant. Are they, I mean, how aware are African-Americans at home about? They're they're aware and they have been aware since world war one because that's a big part of how people describe their experiences when they send stuff back home and there's always been a question for me about how much of that and i think a lot of it is a sense uh, the sincerely the way that they are experiencing mm -hmm. their their travels abroad that ex experiencing it that way requires not seeing other kind of dynamics of empire right. that are happening, but they're so like sort of in a haze of their American struggles that they don't necessarily pick up on the nuances of those. And so part of it is that that's how they're experiencing it, not knowing willfully or otherwise ignorant of the dynamics of empire. But then part of it is also a rhetorical trick, right? Like what better way to challenge America to be a better version of itself than to point to all of these other places where they can claim folks are doing it better. Yeah. Chris, did you want to uh, follow up a little more on the, well, the Nazi Germany thing? Yeah, it just, I mean, there was a graphic that really struck me uh, in the documentary, right? And this is a, a graphic from the Third Reich talking about the racial breakdown in the United States. And um, Adrian described it much better than I did, but it is shocking when you confront something where it says, Nazi Germany is using our model as a method to construct the Nuremberg laws. And, and, and that just really kind of caused me to sit back, but it also, um, the interconnections of all these kind of beliefs and movements uh, yeah. struck me in the documentary and with that graphic. Um, so there's a really moving so Glenda Gilmore's book um, defying Dixie has a chapter that's just called like the Nazis and Dixie and it takes a look at both the way that um, the Nazis looked back at the South but also the way that fascism had a certain kind of purchase in the US and and um, and took hold in small ways in North and South but she talks about W.E.B. Du Bois traveling through Germany in the 1930s. And, you know, Du Bois had been a graduate student in Berlin in the 1890s, maybe, yeah. and loved Germany, would have finished his Ph.D. there if right. he could have afforded to. Took Harvard as his consolation prize oh, when, he couldn't, you know, when he couldn't stay. Yeah, sorry. Um, but when he went back to Germany in the 1930s, he was stunned mm -hmm. by what the Nazis had in his mind had done to this country that he loved. And he was stunned by the viciousness of it. And again, made those comparisons and parallels to the U S but he also said that what the Germans are doing with the Jews here rivals anything that I have ever seen. And I have seen much plenty. Yeah. Right. But he also waited until he was done traveling to send those dispatches back to the Pittsburgh courier because he knew that his mail was being watched and right and what have you. 
We did that's get the a, far field of Marian Anderson. No, Sorry. No, no, no that's no, no. And I think that that's no. really, I mean, uh, what we're trying to do is, is, uh, you know, uh, obviously if you watch the documentary, you get the full picture of Marian Anderson's life, but we're interested in the history in our audience. Many of them have traveled to Europe, uh, uh, to, you know, look at World War II and uh, issues there. And so I think, you know, connecting all of this stuff in the way we're doing is really good. And we did get a, an audience request uh, to explain this map more. And I will say that I don't speak German, um, but basically I think that they're trying to outline the parts of the U.S. where there is in, in black, where there is, uh, you know, heavily more, it's more heavily race-based, uh, and and then you have you have sort of different levels of racial laws going on, uh, you know, with the least being say in um, uh, you know in Maine and in Washington State and and those places. And I think it's you know one of the things that was pointed out in the documentary is that there's a uh, you know that the Nuremberg laws that these are put together by a group of of Nazi lawyers and they are looking at the laws in the United States and using them as, if not an example, then a, an excuse, you know, one, one or the other or both. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, did, and one of the things that I, I think would be helpful too, um, because I'm, you know, a product of, of just kind of your standard U.S. history courses, in America, um, we teach Civil War and Reconstruction, um, and then there's a big gap. Uh, we might mention World War One kind of briefly in passing. Then it's World War Two. Then it's the Holocaust, and then we get to the Civil Rights Movement in the fifties or sixties, which is totally incorrect. I mean, obviously, there are people struggling for civil rights this whole time. So, just so people have a sense, of what's going on? I mean, who like you know, the, the, the Doughboys come home from World War One and they say, "Hey, we've been to France, and this something's not right here." What are they doing? And, they don't and we say, you teach Civil War and Reconstruction, and at least in the version that I learned still, um, not for all of my history teachers, I should say, in fairness, in case any well. of them are watching, but for <laughs> a couple, um, the, the Reconstruction was the world turned upside down, right? right? And the worst thing that had ever happened to the South, right? So it's not taught as this grand experiment in democracy that is truncated part by you know, the federal government losing its will to protect black citizenship, but also by profound and intense race, racial violence and murder. But that's an important part of the story, right? And right. one that will have a reverb effect um, for the next century and beyond that. Um, but so if we kind of, you know, we'll set aside the very fascinating, but a subject for another day, like sort of late 19th century, if we go to the World War One years, as you said, it's sort of, you have World War I, it's a war, as Woodrow Wilson said, not really meaning it, a war for democracy, or at least mm -hmm. that language and that rhetoric gives black freedom activists something to hook on, something to push towards. They come back from, from the First World War kind of determined to make American democracy the thing that it should be, that it has the potential to be a democracy that is for all of the people that live within American borders. And so we talked a little bit about the rise of the Klan, and that is, you know, the manifestation of a struggle, a, an ongoing Black freedom struggle um, led by an NAACP that is empowered, grows a lot during World War I, and then shrinks, is crushed by the kind of racial violence that we see in 1919, but you have this kind of pushback going back and forth throughout the 1920s. Um, a lot of work, a lot of the sort of organizing or civil rights work was done around pushing for federal anti-lynching legislation during the 1920s. That was a way for the NAACP to build branches um, and local branches that got kind of community members involved in every kind of place where a branch grew. Um, you have at the same time, giving you a much longer narrative than you need, so I'll put it, but you have an, a growth okay, of okay. the sort of, what we could oversimplify as black power, but alongside the kind of NAACP-esque struggle for civil rights, you have a movement 
um, that brings in a whole bunch of veterans and everyday folks and others through the Universal Negro Improvement Organization, the Garvey Movement. Um, that is also gets a lot of energy out of the World War I moment, but in some ways reaches out and touches more people than the NAACP does in this period. But you know, whether there are formal branches or not, between kind of the UNIA's embrace of a pan-Africanist energy and the NAACP's oh. vision that you organize kind of branch by branch, place by place, and keep it up, you have a black freedom struggle that's pushing, pushing, pushing against Jim Crow all the way through the 1920s. The depression will change that calculus a bit, both by re releasing a uh, broad energy for social democracy, by having the federal government seem more responsible than it ever has in the past for everyday people's well-being. Um, and by infusing a left that is organizing around anti-fascism as they see the Nazis rising, right? And all of those things come together mm -hmm. to give you this really um, amazing civil rights movement in the 30s. So, That'll take off during World War II, get crushed a little bit by the Cold War, and then Brown resets the terms, right? So we often talk about Brown as the beginning of the civil rights movement. Right. Brown is the beginning of a mass movement that looks the way that it does precisely because of the decades of things that have come before it. So thank you. Uh, and I, I want to I wanna go, um, uh, as we've talked about what's happening in the 30s, let's now go to 1939 uh, and, and what arises here. Marian Anderson's come back from Europe and she is a, a, a sensation now in the United States as well. She goes back to the, the uh, what is the place in New York, the Town Hall, and Town where Hall. she had a, a tough concert, and now she has a, a sort of a victorious concert. Um, uh, so I want to uh, talk about the situation that happens in Washington and play a clip from the film here. She's agreed to do a benefit for Howard University in Washington, which is a historically black college. And, and the people at the university kind of see an opportunity to push some boundaries. And so let's take a look at this clip. Constitution Hall had been built in the late 1920s by the Daughters of the American Revolution to host their annual conventions. When the DAR wasn't using it, the 3,700-seat venue was rented to performers they considered suitably wholesome, cultured, and white. Segregation in Washington theaters and entertainment spaces was pervasive but not consistent. There were a lot of halls that would allow Black performers, but not Black audiences. And then there were some halls, like Constitution Hall, that would only allow white performers. Howard University decided to test the DAR's whites-only policy, hoping that they would make an exception for the highest paid singer in the world, the voice of the century. The rejection was both commonplace and appalling. Yeah, so that's not a lot of subtlety and nuance there. But how does this go from being just a terrible, you know, slap in the face and maybe a, a small newspaper article to being a huge cause celeb? It goes from that because Walter White is a master strategist and Walter White was the executive secretary, the head of the NAACP who realized that, that this was a, a moment when he could, the organization could bring attention to um, the injustices of segregation and the absurdity of the hypocrisy. And that Anderson, by virtue of who, he wa uh, who she was, by both her celebrity and her, I mean, sort of relative non-controversialness, would be a wonderful person and place to push at the DAR. And so he called upon his friend, Eleanor Roosevelt, who was an honorary member of the DAR to help him um, challenge them and challenge their, their rules around segregation. And, and she, she resigns, right? She resigns from the DAR yeah. in, in, in protest and, and, you know, is 
you know, how would you and, and how would you her, how important was her role and how would you you kind of gauge that? I mean, so if Walter White is and he is like Walter White is wily, right? Yeah. And he's connected. Eleanor Roosevelt is um, determined and savvy and far from perfect. She has her blind spot. She has her kind of limits, but she is far more sympathetic to to kind of questions about rights and access than even her husband was, right? And so they made a really powerful duo. So not only does she resign from the DAR in protest, which brings um, attention to this, but she also, I can't remember, I think it's her who approaches Harold Ickes, who's the Secretary of the Interior, about using the Lincoln Memorial as an alternate site for a concert. So there's the symbol, the symbolism of leaving the DAR because they're not maintaining the, tr you know, what they would say the true spirit of, of the revolution. But then there's the even more powerful symbolism of using this space and this site, which we've seen in the past week, right, has this purchase on the American imagination and our sense of, of unity and togetherness for what? this, for I, this I, concert. Chris, can I say one more thing? Or I mean, just I'm, to just, I'm just totally, response. I'm totally killing you right now, and I apologize <laughs> I know, I know. for that. But, but, um, but, but one of the things in the film that 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 killed me, talking about the Lincoln Memorial, uh, just very briefly, is that in the in the dedication of the Lincoln Memorial in 1922, the audience is segregated, and there's not many black people who are invited, and they're told, well, you have to sit you know back here in the section in the in the dirt and the whole thing is well it's not about freeing the slaves it's about you know um keeping well, the union together and it's like i think you missed part of the message but i think isn't yeah. it, i mean i'd be curious to get your thoughts but i mean i think in a lot of ways it's her concert it's this moment when she gets up to sing the sings there that creates that special place that the lincoln memorial becomes yeah. yeah, I don't, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I don't see lots of references to the Lincoln Memorial as being this special place until after this concert, right? I mean, people are aware yeah. of it, but. I mean, you know, the, the idea that black folks would be excluded, that, it, that people would be arguing that this is about emancipation, it's about <laughs> unity, just follows from the the South winning the historiographical argument about what the Civil War was for, what reconciliation means, about the great tragedy of, of the 19th century period not being the enslavement of their fellow humans, right? And the sort of breaking up of families and these things, but, you know, white families not getting along, right? That the, that the regional break is the story and not, and not slavery and the end of slavery itself. By the time the, the Lincoln Memorial was dedicated, African-Americans had been kind of written out of the history of the period. So it comes as little surprise that they would then be barred from the, from the dedication of the memorial. Now, as all this is going on, Adrian, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but Marian Anderson is just getting ready for a concert. I mean, doesn't she make some reference to like, I wasn't even part of this whole thing yeah not yeah. how much truth is there to that or was i mean is this all walter white and nicky's and eleanor is it i mean i don't know where does she fit in this whole so story? i do not know definitively because i have not looked at the documents but it would not surprise me a little bit given what we know of walter white and eleanor roosevelt if no one had thought to clear this with anderson before like i describe right. her be, as Oops. being conscripted into yeah this moment that's mm. the, what i talked about though she's kind of the reluctant hero but she's not unwilling but she's not leaping into it either or, or causing no. it to happen it, so i mean yeah. she strikes me as somebody who is very kind of quiet and reserved and um you know she has her her art and her singing and she uses that to make a statement but throughout the, as i'm watching the documentary there's very little you know, Mary Anderson wrote back and said, this was shocking, or this really upset me, or right. I want, she just sang and she performed and she, yeah. you know, and I, I just think that was, it was fascinating. And I think part of it is that she's just a contained 
her, she's not sort of like talking through her emotions about most things, right? You know, um, which isn't super. I mean, when you think about the like what we talk about in Black women's history, with not necessarily dissemblance, meaning hiding your emotions, but there's, you know, there's a long tradition of Black women keeping themselves to themselves as much as they can, because there are so many people like trying to take pieces of them or projecting things on them or stereotyping around them. So in some ways, Marian Anderson is incredibly recognizable to me because it's the dignity of her self-possession that gives her the strength to keep on going through all of these like tumultuous and oft painful experiences. Mm -hmm. I want to play one more clip from the documentary film um, and uh, just to kind of give a sense of uh, the moment that she arrives at uh, the Lincoln Memorial and what she's become a part of. And it makes sense here because it actually begins with uh, her words. It's not her say, it's an actress reading them, but it's her words uh, about this moment. I had such a feeling that I had never had before. I just couldn't say anything. You know, she'd sung to three, four thousand, you know, maybe five thousand. But this is seventy five thousand people. And they've been standing outside for hours. Anderson would be surrounded on stage by 200 public figures who had signed up as co-sponsors of the event, ranging from Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black to movie star Tallulah Bankhead. Then came the signal that we were to go out. My heart was throbbing to the point that I could scarcely hear anything. She steps down those stairs and she lifts her head up and she begins to look out on the sea of people. Wow, it must have been a, um, I mean, you do kind of get chills just, just looking at that, don't you? It's a crazy number of people. I mean, when you look at the, the crowd, right? And I think I think seventy five thousand might be a an, an underestimate. Although I I think lately we, every time you get five people together, they want to say it's ten thousand. So uh, the the crowds come up. But, but what is? It? Oh, go ahead, Chris. Go ahead. Say, was she aware of what she was going to walk out onto? I I don't know. I don't know how you like. How do you envision something that looks like that before you've seen it? Even if someone told yeah. you the numbers. Right. Because I mean, I don't think. I can't think of any singer at that point in history that would have had a crowd like that. No. You know, and and if you watch that footage, you know, she she walks out and she closes her eyes and I you know, I don't you, know, you don't know what's going through her head, but you wonder if like she's like, "Oh my god, what's going on? What's going to happen?" Right. And then she just gives well, voice. This is an age before stadium concerts and the whole idea of sort of large because you know you don't I mean before go back another 20 years you don't really even have amplification right yeah. so you really couldn't do a, a, a concert of that size and I mean I is there was there well, I'm not asking you this because I expect you to know the answer but you know was there ever I mean I'm trying to think was there ever a concert of this size ever in history before this one I mean it's 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 hard to come up with one yeah I don't know. I looked at it and thought, wow, yeah, this is, this is not Lollapalooza, right? Like, it's, <laughs> yeah. It's like, I also don't have any artistic talent of any kind. So I also try to imagine what it must be like to then trust your own voice enough to close your eyes, take a breath oh, and yeah. go forward, you know? Yeah. yeah. No, and, and what, what is the reaction leading up to this concert and then immediately afterwards because obviously this before the concert this has become a national story eleanor roosevelt writes about it in my day she's resigned the war of words have started everybody knows about it they're pushing the concert so those seventy-five thousand people that go down on the mall know that 
there's some controversy surrounding this event. Mm -hmm. And they still go. And I was wondering if there's any comments about people before the show, but also afterwards. I mean, is anybody like, oh my God, what just happened? Because, you know, I think sometimes we look at historical events after the fact and go, that was really important. But maybe so, what were they? I don't know. So in the black press, there's anticipation. And then in the aftermath, there's pride, right? And I don't know. I mean, there's definitely writing that was like, this is a powerful, significant, you know, sort of, you know, moving concert. But there are a lot of moments. I mean, the black press is news. And sometimes that news is calling things into being so that they will be so if that makes sense. Yeah. And so I don't know, like, you'll get a lot of things that are called historic, you right. know, not game changing is anachronistic, but you know what I mean. Because they want Partially, them to be historic. Yeah, right. because they want them to be. I mean, right. I think that sometimes about the kind of the argument that soldiers are going to go to World War One or World War Two and come back ready to fight for democracy. They right. said that from the moment that people started talking about conscription because they were trying to create yep. this kind of energy and this movement. And I think that um, there's a chance that you like the coverage could be both sincere and and tactical or sincere and aspirational yeah. at the same time you know I, I i try to picture walter right maybe looking at pictures of that concert with her standing there singing and lincoln in the background and in the back of his head just going gotcha you know <laughs> <laughs> exactly argue right. with this yeah so obviously like he's White. kind of created helped create this yeah. moment but um and what's the what's the impact of this moment. Yes. I mean, what historically, as we look back now? Well, I mean, we know, I mean, by the very fact that there's a documentary that in, in, on the end of the century or in the kind of, for those of us who teach the history surveys or go back and do these retrospectives, that the impact in great hindsight is to say, this is one of these moments and these markers when the kind of, when we sort of challenged America or the kind of American government to create something better than it had, to create images, um, possibilities, what have you. And this is a defining one, right? It's a, you, you put the picture up when you're doing a PowerPoint presentation in class and every is and what it means. In the immediate aftermath, I mean, for Anderson, I don't think she ever used it that way. She accepted that other people talked to her about it that way. Um, but she would continue kind of like laboring, doing her career, doing her thing. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's 1939. We know that we're not even, we've got 15 years to go before, you know, the mass public is talking about a civil rights movement. So it, doesn't galvanize i think so much as it symbolizes if mm -hmm. that makes if that makes sense to you well you, they say in the documentary that she doesn't even really ever talk about this concert right she just goes on and so so what happens to her after this this incredible moment does she just continue to be a jobbing singer or is it anything any easier yeah, for i mean her? oh oh wildly success i mean she's already like it's not easy isn't quite but she's already like Kind yeah, of yeah. at the, I mean, she's peaking, it's, uh, yeah, she's right? Peaking, and, right? And she'd continue to do so for, I don't even know the timeline now, maybe another decade, but there's also a kind of, there's going to be a kind of shift in what the black public demands mm -hmm. of its, of its public figures in terms of the, the language of their involvement or the, the kind of frankness of their involvement in civil rights activity. So th there will come a time when she is still successful and respected when she feels to a younger generation conservative with a, you know, yeah. not as fraught as that, that might sound. I don't mean, but like, she'll feel like something from a different time. That said, um, when there's the 1963, march on washington she's there because mlk um and the folks in sclc 
want her to be because they she still symbolizes for them having come up um, in the decades before. She symbolizes for them a black, a beautiful black voice with international purchase and power and the symbolism of the 1939 concert they recognize will infuse the symbolism of the 1963. And, and part of that circle is that uh, Martin Luther King was listening on the radio to Marian Anderson's 1939 concert. Um, so you really do have a full circle yeah. being made there. Yeah. So and I was thinking about her. I was um, watching another documentary that talked about performers like Lena Horne um, and others. And there will be an, another generation of black woman performer who has to strike or, you know, strikes another balance between their career, their outspokenness, their choices, what it means to navigate um, the country and the world. And they might not make the same choices as Anderson, but they have choices available to them because of Anderson. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important to keep in mind. So, yeah. I mean, I think, I've never met her, I, I could be totally off the mark, but I, I think if you were to ask her, you know, what would you be remembered for? She would say as an artist, but she clearly is important to the story of civil rights. What do you think her, I mean, you kind of touched on it, but what do you think her place in the whole civil rights story is? Is she a key figure of it? Is I mean, where does she fit in in the story? Or where would you put her in the story? I mean, I shouldn't say you just mentioned that your, your parents were scientists, so I might be completely mangling this me metaphor, Rick, but I feel like you can be a catalyst and not be an agent, if that makes sense, or you can be... Um, a figure, a symbol, uh, a kind of touch point that gives other people energy and power, even if you aren't necessarily the person articulating the demands or even like sort of down in the trenches on the day to day. I think she matters because she was a famous, incredibly talented black woman who built a career for herself in many ways at a time when that seemed near impossible. And that's amazing, right? And that would be inspiring to all kinds of everyday folks who just needed to imagine different possibilities before they could act, right? And so again, we just spent this moment lingering on what it must have felt like to be Anderson or to be in the audience with Anderson to take away from that concert, like inspiration that could feed mm. all kinds of energies, right? right. Um, I think that's how she matters to the movement. I, it's important for us to keep in mind that even in the height of civil rights struggles, most people were not activists, right? And it does a disservice to the people who were to pretend that everybody was doing um, what a uh, bold few were doing. That said, you know, an activist needs fuel and joy and art and light and hope and possibility in order to have the energy to keep on trying things. And so people like Marian Anderson, and Mary Anderson most significantly because her stage was so big. People like Marian Anderson provide the inspiration for the folks who are going to do the things that most of their neighbors and family or whomever could would find unimaginable before before those things were done. Okay, so Adrian, take a deep breath because um, uh, we're, 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 you've beautifully capped the story of, of Marian Anderson, so we'll change the subject. Uh, but we, uh, and, I, and I first want to bring up a comment from Jean who says, uh, you said you're not an artist, and she took exception because she said, if you wrote a book and a book this good and important, then you are for sure 
an artist. And so oh, thank, thank you, thank you Gene, for, for, for putting that there. But then another viewer uh, from uh, uh, Xavier, who is actually from Spain, watching from Spain, I believe, uh, asks, could the guest talk about freedom struggles? Well, that's your book, so I bet you can talk about it. <laughs> and at least, at least tell us briefly kind of what that book is about, you know, what your, what your take is on this subject, which we have talked before on this show about African-American soldiers in, in World War I. Um, sure. So it's a book about African-American soldiers in World War I, and it really uses them as a way to think about the Black freedom struggle um, in the 19-teens and 1920s. So Chris mentioned, like, how do you think about a long civil rights movement? How do you think about civil rights struggles before that mid-century movement? And how do we even, like, get to the point where a mid-century movement is possible? So I look at these soldiers and the people who love them and live near them and kind of what they expected the war to do um, and the war, the, the ways that fighting for the U.S. in the war inspired and 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 broke their hearts, you know, at different moments, sometimes the same people at different moments, to think about how that produced a, a political consciousness and a determination um, that fueled their civil rights struggles in the, in the 1920s and afterwards. And part of what I'm trying to say is that the folks who built the civil rights movement in the 1940s learned their lessons from the civil rights struggles of the 19 of the 1920s and the 19 teens of the World War One. Well, I, I gotta say that, it, and if you, um, first of all, Xavier, yes, I recommend you buy the book. It's on my recommended reading list for all the World War One trips. So yeah, yes, you it's, should. it's recommended by Chris Anderson, you must buy. <laughs> but also, um, no, in all seriousness, if you ever get a chance um, to go to the Meuse Argonne and you go to some of the places that these men fought, um, the civil rights folks that came after them stand on some pretty big shoulders. Well, and you were talking about, Adrian, and, and, and we, we, we may go one minute over, but not more than that, but you were talking about uh, uh, something that's very dear to our hearts uh, when we talked the other day, uh, which is the importance when you're writing about uh, uh, soldiers in World War I or any war of, of traveling there, of, of going over the ground, and that, that you, you spoke about that very eloquently the other day. Well, that's when I said that I was going to write this book, my professor said, you can't write this book unless you have walked to the ground that these soldiers have walked, unless you've kind of moved through the streets of the fields that they moved in. And at the time, I thought that that was just a really good way to get Yale to give me some travel money because I'd never been to Europe before. Um, but it turned out that he was, yeah, he was exactly right. And that I... I mean, not even that there, there weren't African-American soldiers um, at Verdun, but when I went to Verdun and understood it as a place in a landscape mm. um, and, a, and imagined that landscape wrecked, when I looked at a trench and thought both, it's smaller than I thought, and oh my God, how do you dig a trench? I mean, the, yeah. the reality of it. Right. Not just as stories that I was telling, but as things that people had lived through and had suffered through really hit in a way. It's like the difference between reading a digital, a digitized piece of letter or something and actually sitting in an archive and knowing that you're holding a letter that someone else held and wrote. Right? Well put. She did it much better than you do. <laughs> <laughs> Adrian Lent Smith, thank you so much thank for joining so much. us today. Just that was a fabulous hour. We got many positive comments from people, and uh, hopefully, we'll be able to, you know, in the third or fourth year of the show, we'll be able to have you back <laughs> on <laughs> and do it again. Although, hopefully, we won't be in the midst of a pandemic still. But thank you so much Thanks for joining so much. us. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. All, All right. right. Take care. Take care of yourself. You too. That's it for our Encore episode on Marian Anderson. That was a show that Chris and I both really enjoyed doing and thought uh, that Adrian Lent Smith was terrific and that it's a great and powerful story. Next week, Chris and I will speak to noted Civil War historian Alan Gelzo about his book, Robert E. Lee, A Life. Lots to talk about there with the Civil War general whose uh, the view on him has changed remarkably over the years. Uh, we hope you'll join us for that show. And since Chris isn't here to say it, let me remind you, stay safe, everybody. <laughs>